My pleasure to introduce our speak the speakers for our Fisher Speaker Series, our Coil Fisher Speaker Series session. Uh, and those speakers are Drs. George Seaman and Dr. Dragan Gasovich. And they are George Siemens, you, you may know from his work in the MOOC space and data analytics. And my computer just shut down, but there it was on the end. Um, he was one of the first professors, in fact, in most people's view. He was the first professor. Yeah, don't don't wave the microphone around. Is that it? <laughs> he was the first professor to offer a MOOC, so he sort of started the whole MOOC thing. Um, he also founded Solar, the Society of for Learning Analytics Research. Okay, and uh, with Dragon actually started Solar, and the uh, analytics conference, LAC, the uh, analytic, analytics conference as well. George is a professor and executive director of the Link Research Center. LINK stands for Learning, Innovation, and Network Knowledge Research Center at the University of Texas in Arlington. And uh, Dragon is, at the moment, Professor and Canada Research Chair for Semantic and Learning Technologies in the School of Computing and Information Systems at Athabasca University. But in three weeks, he will be at University of Edinburgh, where he will be chair of their new learning analytics group there and research lab over there. So, uh, and they just both finished teaching a MOOC on data analytics with Carolyn Rose uh, on edX. Uh, so they're very involved in that space. But the reason they're here is they're also uh, excellent scholars and futurists. They're thinking about what the future of education looks like and look, thinking about that from like the learner's perspective. They see a very different kind of future and they're tool builders. They're building tools sort of support that new vision of what learning is all about. So it's for that reason that uh, I got excited when I, I participated in that MOOC on data analytics and saw a tool that they've created called ProSolo. And uh, I could tell from that tool and other things I've heard from them that they believe in this different model. So I said, come here, talk with us about that. We're interested in learning where it's headed and also in perhaps developing and supporting the development of new tools that support learning. So they accepted our invitation very quickly. Uh, we had to grab them before Dragon leaves the, the continent. And uh, so we accelerated this a little bit. Thanks for being here before the semester officially begins. And with that, I'll turn it over to George is going to start this off. Great, George. thank you. I guess you have your own. Yeah, that'll be all right. Thanks. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to say a uh, particular thank you to, to Kyle as well for the generous invitation to spend some time uh, with you here. I've had several visits to Penn State over the, the past uh, three or four years, and uh, certainly I'm impressed by the quality of thinking that's happening around digital learning, digital education, and what in turn that might mean to the future of the university. Now, as uh, Kyle mentioned, one of the views that we have is very much understanding the future of learning through the lens of the learner. There's been a lot of dialogue that's focused on what's happening in the university system, how are MOOCs going to impact higher education? How is adaptive learning? How is technology? How are these different tool sets going to influence education? And these are, of course, relevant questions. But it's really difficult to have those conversations if you omit the reality or the lived experience of one of the critical stakeholders in this process, which is obviously the student or the learner that's involved. And so the discussion we're going to have today is going to look broadly at what we think the future of learning will look like. Now, we're quite careful to say not what does the future of the university look like, because that's a very different type of a conversation. And I think it's a bit of a fool's game to try and look at how does a trend impact 30 years down the road on the actual structure of a system, when right now we have so many elements up in the air. There are so many things that we don't quite understand yet that really we should all have regarding the state of learning and even the, the emerging shape of different institutions. We should essentially have a research, uh, researcher's mindset regarding the exploration of phenomena that isn't stable right now. We don't quite know what it is. And so when folks stand up and say, oh, in 10 years, there's only going to be 50% as many universities in the US as we have today, I mean, they, don't have a, they really don't have a clue. It's a stab in the dark, because there are too many factors at play to make specific predictions like that. One of the things that we can do and what we're going to do in our talk today is look at two particular elements. One, we want to talk about a series of 10 trends that we think are reasonably consequential in shaping what learning will become going 
And so we're just going to look at a few sort of a 10 pack of what's happening and what might you want to be aware of that's going to impact in many ways the current vision of learning that we have in a lot of institutions. From there, we're going to turn, spend a little bit of time that looks at what are some of the implications of that. What does that mean structurally and perhaps even systemically, but more relevant from the perspective of the learner and the educator, what does that mean to some of the key stakeholders in that process? There's a few tension points that I think we see in not just universities, but we see broadly in society as well. And there are fields, obviously, music, the entertainment industry, the uh, journalist field that have experienced this kind of an impact, which has a range of influences that we don't fully understand yet. In some ways, the ship is writing a little bit, especially with regard to some aspects of journalism. If you were following what was happening with Web 2.0 in the in mid 2000s, yeah, Web 2.0 is going to do exactly two systems what MOOCs were going to do to universities. It was going to deprofessionalize. We wouldn't need journalists. We wouldn't need newspapers. We could all just take pictures of things that happened around us, tweet it, and that would be the brave new world of journalism. And we're, we're a little more level-headed now that the trend cycle has passed, and all of a sudden we're finding, you know what, we actually kind of like journalists. Uh, we, we like somebody who is a, a part of a power structure that holds government and other associations accountable. We like the idea of an investigative journalist that can dig deep into things that none of us would have time to do. So this idea of these big changes and the relationship that it has between the individual and the institution. So this is not a versus. This is consider these as points on a continuum and at various spaces we're moving along that, that particular dimension. Another aspect that we're seeing an impact of or a tension point is this relationship between structure and unstructured. This is something that I think we're seeing quite significantly in any kind of a media-related field, but certainly in learning fields that's growing in influence as well. So what I mean with structured and unstructured is just this idea that who gets to package and put something together for someone else to consume? And then who has the influence to make sure that someone else consumes that? Now in education right now, we have a model where the educator has an enormous amount of control in packaging curriculum and determining readings and text and so on and the student essentially has to walk through it. But I found an interesting transition in online teaching at least when I discovered that the relationship that students had with content changed fairly significantly over the last five or six years. So it used to be if I would assign a reading in a course, what would happen is students would primarily center, if we did a network analysis of that reading and then a discussion forum interaction, bulk of the interactions would be centered on that reading. They would reference the reading and, and it would really be the central hub of a network of interaction. There would be some student interaction with each other, but it was focused on the, this particular reading that, that had been assigned for that week. And about five, six years ago, there was a bit of a transition in online forums where suddenly I would assign a reading for a particular uh, module. Students would discuss the reading and then someone would come by and say, oh, you know what, I read this, uh, this neat paper here. Or has anybody seen this report? Or I, was, I saw this TED Talk video, or I took a MOOC, and all of a sudden the, the influence of the readings that I had assigned were giving way to more of an emergent collaborative creation of what learners felt was relevant. And in some cases this would produce discussions like, oh, I, I read that, but I don't agree with it for these and these reasons. But the important thing that was happening was that students were starting to become more active owners and more substantive participants in the learning experience rather than just consuming what I thought was important. Uh, final dramatic trend, or at least tension point, I should say, is this relationship between centralized and decentralized. Now, traditionally, a range of institutions have been able to essentially be centralized systems. So you have, whether it's the government, whether it's a news agency, or even whether it's a university system, which meant that, that you had a hierarchical model in many ways, but you controlled what happened. And at this point, it's very, very difficult for systems to be able to control what happens now. We've seen this with a range of of uprisings that have happened in different parts of this world. We see this with hashtags that develop on Twitter that suddenly raise attention to things that traditional media might have ignored. You know, Ferguson would be one example that it took uh, probably about three, four days of active momentum and activity on Twitter before it transitioned into a broader national conversation. So there's a range of things that these that you, you can't control the narrative the way you could when you're the only broadcast channel in town. And the same happens in our classrooms. So even now, I'm sure while well, all of you are going to listen very intentively to this lesson, but some of you right now are in the middle of an email. And, uh, but that's just the reality of, of learning in this approach where you can't control the message and increasingly things are decentralized and distributed. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about specific trends 
uh, in a few slides. But just before we make that or we'll start with that conversation, I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about change models because we do spend a fair amount of time talking about universities are going to change, the system is going to be different, or learning is changing. And quite often we don't spend a lot of time looking at well, what are the underpinning models, or what can we even learn from sectors that have gone through some dramatic cycles of change. And so I'm just going to briefly introduce a series of elements here, the different frameworks or perspectives of change. One that you've probably all heard about, which will be on your left, is the idea of disruptive innovation. It's been receiving a fair bit of criticism lately, and it's one of those ideas that has now become pavlov, meaning that everybody just sort of, it's a soft, fuzzy term that really doesn't mean much in a lot of cases anymore because it's been so well overused. Another aspect is that the idea of disruptive innovation was actually related to a very specific type of, at least Christensen based a lot of it on, was a specific type of manufacturing. And so at this point, the idea that that kind of innovation is going to work in social systems is, uh, is a bit suspect. Has, at least at this point, hasn't been challenged or validated. The work of disruptive innovation is heavily based on uh, work of uh, Joseph Schumpeter, uh, his idea of creative destruction. Uh, he was an economist, and his views were that certain things happen, and over time, something new and better comes along. It destroys the old, and you have this new thing that comes on and serves the needs of society or the needs of a particular group more effectively. We certainly see that with companies regularly where you have an organization that at one point, let's say BlackBerry at a point, was the smartphone device, which that's kind of changed a little bit, and it came in an extremely short cycle of time. Then there's a, uh, three other points I want to reference. These are the ones that I have the greatest affinity to, personally. Uh, one is this idea that Thomas Kuhn and Brian Arthur and others have shared is about complete structural or mindset shifts, if you will, in certain Initially, when Kuhn looked at it, he looked at the different scientific models, and he found that science collects, if you will, a series of anomalies that go through the process of normal science. So we're doing research work, we're finding a few little niggling things off to the side, but it's not challenging sort of the dominant view or narrative yet. So we just keep moving along, we keep doing our science, our science work, but then all of a sudden you get to this point where you hit a cycle of extraordinary or extraordinary science where all of a sudden you have a complete shift, almost like a phase state or a phase change in how we look at a particular topic. And so when you hit that stage, we can spend a good portion of our time going through normal activity and little things build up, but eventually those little things become too significant to be ignored, and then that's when we hit sort of that, that dramatic shift in perspective. Obviously looking at uh, Einstein being one of the more notable ones, or even the idea of, of uh, you know, moving, uh, the idea of a heliocentric universe and so on, some of these transitions. The other aspect of change, and this is one that I've found personally extremely relevant in trying to think through and understand what's happening societally, is the idea of the long cycle of change and adoption of new technologies. Probably the best writings that I've seen on this relates to the electrification of America. And Paul David, this was in the 80s, I believe, where there was a lot of talk about, you know, we're seeing computers everywhere, but we're not seeing them in the productivity. So from an economic perspective. So what Paul David did was he looked back and he said, well, when if we had something big happen, and it took a while for this to actually have an impact. And he looked at the electrification of America, and he found that over time, the initial impact of electricity, moving away from other sources of, of energy, the initial impact of electricity just duplicated what was being done already. So if you had a building in the past, a, a manufacturing space, multi-story facility, you would have the same structure you would have on the bottom floor, you would still have the, the engine powering it, but now instead of using some other uh, source of energy, you were using electricity. But the structure of the building remained the same. So it's like this new innovation essentially first did the work of the old innovation, but then over time, folks came along and said, you know what, we can actually do things quite differently. Uh, we could, let's say, do an assembly line where we have electrical outlets at different stations. We don't need that central shaft uh, running up the floor. And then over time, once people understood that there's something different, the affordances, if you want to use it, uh, Gibson's terminology, but the affordances of this technology enabled an entirely new way of uh, functioning as a system. And then over time, that result of what we see today in, in our uh, factories or buildings and so on. So it's this idea that initially we don't quite understand what a thing is for. It takes time until we get that understanding. Now the final one that I want to look at, which I think is the most relevant one, certainly from the educational lens, is the work of folks like Carlotta Perez that look at uh, the techno, socio, and economic dimensions of change. It's what happens when you have significant changes, such as globalization, 
or when you have an entire population suddenly having tools of personal control. Mobile devices where you can report incidents of whether it's police abuse or crime or uh, an accident that's happening in real time, such as with, with the Hudson River landing and so on. And so you have the, the advances of the technology, you have the influence socially, and you have the underpinning economic structure that's the result of it. Now let's just briefly, before we look into our 10 points, I, I'm not going to spend time looking at all of these elements, which you know, some of these dramatic shifts. I want to look specifically, though, just at some of the techno-socioeconomic shifts that sit on your bottom left hand of the screen, which is that we're seeing an emergence of a knowledge and learning economy and a creative economy. But we're seeing a series of transfers, capital-wise, that are quite dramatic. Uh, a transfer that's uh, changing, let's say, moving from west to east, and transfer that's moving from north to south of capital and capital influence. So a lot of the energy and the momentum is in regions of the world that over the last 150 years may, might not have been part or significant parts of the conversation. And also economically, and this is one of the big things that's impact higher education in the U.S., was 2008, where you had significant, the two nationally, of billions of dollars of state funding for higher education evaporated, which then, of course, contributed to driving up tuition and the rate of other education. So that's, these are models of change. So when we're starting to move through the rest of it, I particularly want to focus on uh, the idea of socio, techno, and economic change pressures as being of great enough influence to change even something that we have today, which is our current structured model of learning and ways that we interact with different concepts, different ideas, and how we do for ourselves what, in many cases, universities and faculty members used to have to do for us. So these are the 10 points we're going to talk to. I'm not going to run through them all in sequentially in detail now, but we'll do it on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So one of the first things that we're seeing, I think many of us are well aware of this already, but it's this idea of the complexification of higher education, that we're, we're experiencing a growing range of learning needs. We're experiencing learning that runs the, the cycle of life. It doesn't just run for four years. We're seeing that a single narrative of what a university is in society isn't sufficient anymore. And this is an important opportunity, and I think it is a significant opportunity because the best time to drive change is when things are already changing. When a system is more stabilized, change is a lot harder because it, there's so much inertia. But once there's movement in a system and a few things are up in the air, all of a sudden you can start to drive change forward. So for focused university systems or for focused leaders who are willing to adopt and take on a visionary stance, this is a great time to start to say, how can the university become more relevant in all aspects? How can it become more relevant to people who are in the workforce? How can it become more relevant to the communities that we're situated in? How can it become more relevant to the alumni that were part of our, uh, of our larger network and so on? So it's really an opportunity to rethink the university as, as a complex organization that serves a broadening set of society. A second aspect that we're seeing, and this I'm going to return to because this in many ways is central to the hypothesis or the thesis at least that we're going to be advancing in this talk, which is that we don't understand what the future of universities will be, but we do have an indication of the attributes that those systems will possess and the attributes of learning. And they're largely based, for lack of a better term, on the structure and architecture of information and knowledge exchange. So the systems, the knowledge systems, and even the corporations and the organizations and governments that we're going to have in the future are going to essentially reflect and embody a range of attributes that we now see around how information is created validated, shared, utilized, how it's taken up. And, and you can't ignore, for example, when you have political uprisings that happen when people are connected and they discover an injustice. Uh, the, the ability to have influence on, within the network and as part of the network as a countering influence to what used to be centralized influence is substantive and it's something that I think is very important for university leaders at least to think about and to be aware of what's the impact that this has. Now that we're interacting with information in an open, distributed, social way, how long will our students accept coming into our classroom, sitting, listening to what we have to say, jumping through the assessment hoops that we provide, and then go on with their life, when every other aspect of their life has been influenced by digital technology that have given them greater control in spaces where they previously didn't have control. On a very broad level, another aspect that this is formed, or at least is a part of, is this idea of control and this idea of openness. So when you look at, for example, the growth of the OER movement, and you have systems now that are offering completely textbook free degree, which is a substantial cost saver for individual students. So folks at uh, Lumen Learning, uh, David Wiley and others have been working with, uh, with Tidewater College in particular, but a range of other systems to try and advance this idea that if you want to reduce the cost of education, maybe a great place to start is to reduce the cost of the learning materials 
And this is something that right now, in many cases, publishers aren't reducing costs. So if you go to digital learning content, which now you don't have to buy a textbook anymore, all of a sudden it's like, well, why should it be the same price? You're not having to print it. You don't have to ship it. It's much easier. And I had the same experience. So my son was uh, got an Xbox uh, for Christmas. And so he, he started ranting about, you know, I used to have to go to the store to pick up a, a new game. And now I can just download the game online. And I'm paying the exact same price that I would if I went to a store. And so I think end users start to feel, well, wait a sec, this isn't quite right. This doesn't make sense. And so I think we're seeing the same thing around openness, where we're realizing that content is broadly available in different spaces. Uh, consortium arrangements, where you create textbooks together, such as what Washington State system has done, can be very effective in creating or reducing a significant part of the educational cost. And that openness is also reflected though, around scholarship. Where do we publish? How do we publish our articles? Are we working with open access journals or closed journals? And we're also seeing something that I think is going to be uh, increasingly relevant for us to start thinking about, and I know Penn State has been quite active in leading on this, but it's the granularization of learning. The idea of badges and badging and what exactly badges mean to uh, university systems. And how do we start to account for learning that comes in a range of other spaces that we perhaps hadn't fully intended? Now at this point, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to a colleague, Dragan Gasovich, who's going to lead through a series of other points on this, and then I'll show up again. Thanks, George, and great to be uh, So another important uh, trend that we are already observing, and that's something that George and I had a pleasure to participate in many different activities, is the big data. And we can basically already see that in many different institutions we are collecting so many different data points that are being collected by institutions forever. Since we ever had uh, universities, we always were collecting data, except now that we are in the position that we are able to collect more granular type of data. The the critical point for many of these institutions is to understand who our learners are, what our learners' needs are, what weaknesses learners may have, and what is the progression that learners may need. However, what we are typically expecting from these different types of models is that they would predict and make many different predictions. What happens in many cases is that we are just discovering associations, that is to say correlations between two different sets of variables rather than that we are able to determine different types of causations. So we don't know whether certain types of variables are making a co cause why students are performing well or not. However, we are, as the institutions, not having very high level uh, of data analytics IQ. Even important decision makers are not having that level of proficiency. And we, as institutions, need to grow to the level. So analytics itself, as according to the words of Shea Dawson, should not be understood at all as a technology, but it has to be understood as a process, as a general process that we are all going through, or every single stakeholder that is, in, that is involved in that process. So in that sense, we need to understand how to uh, read these data, how to interpret the types of data, and then we need to also understand that it's not necessarily that we are always, by collecting more and more data points, that we are going to make better predictions. There was a great article published uh, earlier this year um, by uh, Justin Reich out of uh, Harvard University, in which he basically pointed out to some of these issues that are related to the MOOC research and MOOC practice, that we are collecting terabytes of data, but we really don't understand what's happening in the brains of our students. And it is really something that we really need to go much farther than we are at the moment. Another interesting thing, which is also emerging and an important trend that we envision that will be happening, is basically this move, this transition from the integrated solutions that are presently available in many different uh, universities. This is also coming from the general enterprise computing. There are many companies in the, in the past and in the present as well were always looking for a very close type uh, enterprise solution. All of a sudden, a few years ago, we could see even in general trend enterprise 2.0 arena that we are looking for these different types of decoupled solutions. The moment we are realizing that there are these different types of uh, solutions, we also need to be looking into the needs. And George pointed out to this uh, general drivers that are coming socio-technical, economical drivers. And we have certain social problems that universities are trying to solve. These problems are pretty much coming with the need that many different individuals need to have many degrees so that we can basically have better prepared workforce. 
On the other hand, we also have many individuals who are unable to afford to go to education at the same time, even if they are managing to come to education and get some of those opportunities, they are still not getting uh, enough chances because students who are coming from uh, from poverty, they are basically much uh, less off to complete university degrees than those who are not. So this is a really big societal need, but also has a big uh, economical implications as well. So uh, we've, we, of course, cannot build more and more campuses and technology is seen typically as a rescue. Therefore, that creates basically a need for development of new technological solutions. However, these technological solutions are not necessarily something that is the core university business. And that basically then creates opportunities for universities, first of all, to partner with different technological companies, secondly, to start up new uh, companies, and finally, also to build the opportunities for even launching new companies, that is to say, to create different types of incubators. Based on these new uh, companies that are building these types of new incubators, then new startups are actually building partnership relationships with universities. And then at the same time, we can see the growth of partnership opportunities that are pretty much building and developing universities at the same time companies as well. I think uh, Civitas Learning is a really interesting company in that sense. It's probably the only specialized learning analytics uh, startup company that we can find in the present market. But what is interesting with that company is although they have technology, they also got to realize that they need to help universities to build their own data analytics capacity. Therefore, they are much interested to organize different types of channels, different types of professional development opportunities for universities to get to appreciate and recognize what are their needs. Because they cannot solve all the problems for the universities, and they need to raise that, uh, so to say, uh, data analytics awareness of the institution. At the same time, we can see uh, some interesting partnerships, such as Arizona State University, uh, with different venture capital uh, organizations, where, are, where basically universities partnering with VC organizations in order to help academics to uh, move farther to faster to the market, new ideas and technology. At the same time, universities are also recipients. And finally, we can also see probable trends that this will also go and lead into new types of jobs. And although we can anticipate that some of the existing jobs or many existing jobs will die or will not exist in 10 to 15 years, uh, new, many new jobs will be created. So for example, it's a very well paid today and very, uh, you know, it's a huge demand for, for example, learning analysts. And many similar types of jobs will be created in this space. And we cannot even envision what kind of these ecosystems will be creating. Another important thing, of course, which we are envisioning and it will be even much more emphasized is a need for personalized and adaptive learning. Personalized learning in the first uh, place that we need to push that learning control and the learning demand onto the learners. And secondly, adaptation in terms of basically providing better learning support in terms of technology. If we want to scale that up, we need to also be able to provide uh, better types of feedback or better type of uh, uh, process and form, formative feedback and advice to our students. What is interesting in this space, and this is uh, still, I would say, and I, I would assess in, in very early stage that there are some adaptive learning organizations happening. Some of them that are basically developing platforms, uh, such as like Newton or Smart Sparrow, which are coming from scratch, or some other organizations such as Desire to Learn um, that acquired recently an organization called uh, Knowledge uh, with their product Knowledge Leap out of Vancouver. And then at the same time, we can also see that publishers as well are entering into that arena as well. And they are trying to adapt their existing content. They own the content, but they are realizing the content itself is not enough anymore. And they need to provide with that content additional educational opportunities. Obviously, uh, we can see many of these different technological solutions that are happening at the moment. And they are in many cases just trying to adapt content. However, we can anticipate much more growth towards the solutions which will be hopefully better integrated with the existing knowledge what we know about teaching and learning and try to scale up some of the existing uh, best uh, teaching practices, such as, for example, building on the research on self-regulated learning or provision of feedback or even generating support for learners to take the stronger ownership of their learning. And that would truly lead into more personalized type of alert learning. <coughs> 
Uh, another important trend, and probably will be even happening more and more, is something which is coming with the more types of devices, such as wearable devices, contextual computing, or uh, ambient computing. Obviously, the best example that we can all easily associate with is quantify itself. Many of you, I'm sure, even in this room, are using different types of devices, or even our smartphones are having many apps that are helping us to track our just healthy behaviors. To what extent? And for example, we are needing recommendations for walking. Many people forget that you really need to walk every day at least five to six thousand steps or even more. And once we basically know that those are some of the requirements, and once we have that small device which is telling us that we are not meeting those requirements, many people really don't feel so well and they are really trying to be proactive. Of course, in learning, we need much more sophisticated types of uh, uh, devices and the types of sensors that we'll be looking into, for example, different types of emotional states of our learners, and so that we can see to what extent we can provide that type of help, or even to what extent we can sense uh, what are the types of potentially cognitive states we are assigned. Uh, obviously, some of these ambient computing and contextual computing is uh, possible. Uh, great examples could be seen at ETFL in uh, Lausanne uh, with the work of Pierre Dillenberg, where they are trying to have these instrumented classrooms in which they are having many different cameras, trying to use facial recognition where they are recognizing different emotional states of their students. Obviously, that's one possible sensor. Many other sensors could be derived probably even from simple text messaging and interaction students or learners will have in the future with technology. Another thing which is really important to realize this trend of bundling and unbundling, and rebundling. So the role of university control on, and the monopoly of the overall higher education is changing. It is not dying completely or it is not that it will be fully declining. However, it is changing and we need to revisit what those changes will be happening. In that sense, end-to-end -end solution that universities are presently holding that monopoly onto is not something which is probably will stay for long. And that is to say, we presently see learners who are coming as uh, high school graduates, and they are basically input. We basically go and push them through our four-year system and their final product. First of all, learning is not happening just inside of the university. We get to realize that. Uh, learning is happening outside and happening at work and many other different locations. And we basically have products of our learning. And we are even creating evidence, and we are even marketable for that type of learning. The second important thing is that uh, universities basically uh, still can be there in a need to help many learners to recognize what, what they already have in terms of their learning, and at the same time help them to establish credentials, and to help them to credential their skills and their learning, and also identify the gaps, and basically help them in that back filling uh, elements. Uh, of course, in that process, of uh, bundling and unbundling, it, there is also a need to diminish this notion of credit powers. We presently are so much developing all our systems around credit powers, assuming that every single learner who is entering into university, but also entering into each of the courses that, that we have in our universities, have the same level of background knowledge, metacognitive skills, etc. We basically are making these assumptions that we have learners on average. And research shows a learner on average doesn't exist. Everybody is unique and we pretty much make, can only make assumptions on learner with the sample size of one single. Therefore, basically tracking that hour, tracking that hour is basically looking for solutions such as competency-based approaches that are considered by some of the universities. In this process, when we are trying to track these, tracking, uh, these credit hours, we also need to look for different types of models for assessment, for different types of credentials. And there are different types of approaches. Penn State is also doing different types of experiments with badging. Obviously, badging is one approach, how to do that. With competencies, we also can consider additional types of uh, credentialing processes. Some of them, those will be very formal assessment processes. Others will be more portfolio, where you are coming with your prior knowledge. And some institutions already have prior uh, assessment uh, learning uh, institutions, established organizations in, in, within their ecosystem. But of course, probably the trend will be that this will be taking more and more significant role because we'll be tracking those 
Now, of course, the other important thing is then if we have these unique learners that are coming in our institutions, if they are already profiles that are established, then they have basically universities to help them to plan future their careers, to see what are their potential opportunities, and perhaps universities would work closer to the, with the market, but also with different other social sector institutions, because it is not just everything marketplace, but also there are many things related to sustainability, and they will be also creating and acquiring different types of skills as well. So with this, we are concluding our 10-point uh, uh, list of the trends that we are seeing that will be probably dominating next five to ten years in education and technology and landscape. And obviously, there's another important thing. Given that we are really talking about uh, these uh, socio-technical economic systems, we also need to think about different types of tools and technologies we really need to develop. We are presently using many different tools. We are using many iPads. We are collecting all these different types of information. However, we also need to understand that we can use this very few applications from the web. And we cannot keep up really with everything. So we need to help learners to deal with that information overload. We are pretty much all the time overloaded. And we need to help them also uh, manage their own personal knowledge. In a sense, learning is getting much closer to that notion of knowledge management where the individual is in the center of that knowledge management. So some of the tools, of course, are there. And some of them are in the experimental setting. Some of the tools we developed recently, and they were also inspired by some of the previous work that Stephen Downs and George Simmons did on the tool called Grasshopper. Uh, we also use a similar uh, principle in the technology we are working on, which is called Prosol, and we had a chance to talk about that earlier today and previous and, the, and yesterday as well. The whole idea basically behind that is that learners are using many different technologies. They're using blogs, learning management systems, Twitter, etc. Uh, the whole point of this, and we hope that the future trend will be, and George had many points about that as well in his previous talks, was that learners really need to have the ownership of their space, especially if you are talking about the learners of the future. And if we are talking about recognition of their prior learning and these unbundling and unbundling opportunities for learners and competencies, then learners basically need to have their own space. So that space, they are also having their own identity. That identity can be both personal and professional. However, the moment they are entering into the into these into these credentialing opportunities and to these more formal systems. We need to collect these bits and pieces of data and information that are relevant for them, and they are defining their profile. Therefore, there is a need to build these aggregators that are helping individuals, but also networks, to see what's happening and what is the relevant information, what is the product of their learning, or what is the information relevant for them. While we are pretty good at aggregating some of these bits and pieces, there are, of course, still challenges with respect to, for example, identity management, how I can know that the, it is the same user on Twitter and, and blog. That could be challenging, unless I have some uh, unique place to identify some of these uh, elements. It is still the problem of filtering. How I can identify what is something relevant for my learner. There is basically typical assumption in machine learning and data mining field that we always make these predictions about relevance or filtering based on the past information. However, is that really true when we are actually looking and seeking for new types of jobs or when we are creating knowledge, right? Or when we are trying to identify what to do next? So in that sense, these filtering algorithms need to probably harness even more so some of these social computing elements, not just the machine learning elements, where we basically can see what are those leaders in the thinking or what are those individuals who are generating new and more innovative knowledge that should be driving us to certain new goals rather than just oh, picking on my present interests, which are defining my past. This is pretty much similar to the notion, would be similar to the notion of uh, learning styles, which are also proven not to be effective, because we are not really going uh, to cater to the weaknesses of our learners, but rather we want to help them to develop strength and to become uh, self-developed learners. Eventually, some of these technologies, including uh, uh, ProSol, they are trying to generate these daily uh, digest for them. However, we can see probably the technology of the future will be also generating these uh, updates in more real time. 
it will be coming probably also as a part and an alignment of the existing app that individual call learning that are tell, telling them what is relevant to their existing uh, learning and work. Another important thing is in terms of technologies that we need to develop and this is also requiring a much closer look into instruction as well and careful basically uh, interplay between pedagogy and instruction is basically that we need to treat learners uh, as if they have different needs and they can basically go uh, between different opportunities for their learning. But we are saying that we would like as an idea and we will anticipate that learners will need more and more to be self-directed. There are still many needs that learners will have much more sequential structured learning opportunities. And this is the model that we try to experiment with in the recently completed uh, uh, learning analytics MOOC with edX where we basically try to have the uh, dual, dual learning model. And we basically then would like and the ideal learner would be primarily always in that connected knowledge space where the learner is self-driven, owns their space for learning and doesn't really require much of the interference of the sequence. However, we basically are seeing a need that learners will be oscillating between two different pathways. I may encounter certain elements in my learning that I don't really have sufficient uh, amount of background. I don't have really those social networks and I really don't have easy access to the good quality of information. Therefore, I may go into more structural courses that are providing me with very strong scaffolds how I'm going through that process. However, then I would need then to realize uh, I'm done with that and I can be doing many more things by myself. Therefore, we are seeing this need uh, and this oscillation with technology that will be helping individuals to go from more structured lecture-oriented models to more self-directed and self-driven models of learning. Obviously, this model is probably is going to get even blurrier because we are going to see also many classes that will be diminishing the notion of lectures as well and being providing more active learning opportunities for learners in, in classroom. Of course, it doesn't mean that the lecture will go away completely. There is also, and there will be always probably, at least in the foreseeable future, a need for great lectures, and they are always very useful to advance someone's knowledge and learning. So at this point, I'm going to turn back again to George. Thanks, Dragon. Uh, that was uh, well articulated. Uh, I've just got to figure out how to put this back on. And so um, the, the ideas that Dragon presented both in terms of the change patterns that we're facing uh, around everything from data and analytics and some of the decline of the end-to-end -end integrated university system, credentialing and more authentic assessment approaches, and then as he concluded over with his last several slides, the role that we're seeing around educational technology that aligns well with rather than fights with your learners. And what I mean by that is it aligns with the reality of how they learn and how they interact with the world and how they interact with information. And so with that, as a, and then most recently the experiments that we were involved with with the MOOC that we recently finished on, on edX where we we're looking at sort of a dual layer approach and recognizing that learners need multiple pathways. They need different, there are times where you need structured information and there's times where you need the ability to create your own and blaze your own pathways and contribute to the larger a quantity of information learning resources rather than just being a consumer. So with that in mind, there's a range of organizations that have started to pay attention to what does this mean? What's the impact of this? So what are some of the tool sets that are influencing this? And here's a few that I think are, are amongst the most relevant that I've seen so far. At least some of these have different stages of development, but uh, some of, and some of them are certainly further along. And I'll be honest, I'm personally a fan of of tools that are the idea of uh, small single functionality tool sets that are loosely connected or at least that are connectable. Meaning that you don't want, if you want learners to own their own spaces and own their own learning, they need to be able to have tool sets that don't lock them into a system where they'll do absolutely everything. And so a few recent examples, so with Known, which is a project that Ben Wordmuller uh, has initiated and it's something that he was one of the first folks that, well he was one of the co-founders of Elm, if you're familiar with that platform. Uh, ELG was basically a pre-Facebook, in fact it was Facebook before Facebook existed, uh, and ELG basically allowed for social networking in a fairly structured or closed space, which meant the value of networking and interacting with others, but without the full impact of an open web where you might not want to share all of your content with whoever's there. 
At Athabasca, for example, there's a project called The Landing that John Braun and Terry Anderson created, which is an institutional social network service for learners. Because it's an online system, learners then have the ability to still connect with one another in, in a more meaningful or significant way without having to worry about, is everybody online going to see this stuff? A recent project, this is something that Michael Caulfield has been quite actively involved with, is this idea of, uh, of a federated wiki. The concept being that instead of a wiki being positioned somewhere in a random space, a uh, wiki is actually something that you use as a personal knowledge management tool. And you connect and you can share, but uh, as you're interacting in your wiki, it continues to build up your personal knowledge in, in much a Wikipedia-like way, but it's something that's for you and that reflects your learning until your learning needs and interests. Another example of a project that I think is extremely exciting is the work that uh, Jim Groom and Jim Owens and others uh, have, been, have initiated, which is this idea of a domain of one's own, which very much resonates with some of the concepts that we've been mentioning here about learners need to have ownership of their own space of learning, learners need to have ownership of the tools that they use for learning, they need to have ownership of their data, they need to put some conditions on who gets to see that data and for what purposes. And so there's a range of challenges around there, and that's one illustration of a project that I think is quite interesting in its potential impact. So it's basically saying, you know, take back the, the, uh, the identity of your own learning rather than having that stay in an institutional system that you don't have access to later on. Uh, there's a few other projects at Unison, uh, which many of you may already be aware of, but it's, it's a, more of a systemic project. And the, of the two that are on here, UTX and Unison are the ones that I would classify as being systems level, which is an attempt for systems to improve the functionality of learning architectures and also to then be able to provide learners with better support or better options uh, for uh, their own learning activities and then institutions to improve their negotiating influence with potential vendors and suppliers. A UTX is something similar. It's basically a technology stack that will serve the UT system broadly. The other ones, the, the known, the domain of one's own, uh, are targeted for individuals having control and influence rather than it being something that is pushed off to uh, institutional software. There's a few, the last few I just want to reference. One is the Open Learning Initiative, initially at Carnegie Mellon, still at Carnegie Mellon, but now with Kansas Steel's transition out to Stanford University, uh, there's a Stanford University Open Learning Initiative as well, which is a great example of how teaching and learning might happen in more adaptive ways and where students have a greater degree, uh, degree of control. Uh, Stephen Downs, who in many ways, is, is, if you're not reading his work, it'd probably be a good idea just to follow his daily email newsletter. Uh, he has many opinions. And, uh, but he's, he's probably the most informed, most broadly informative individual in the ed tech space. And a lot of the work that uh, we did initially with the first couple of MOOCs that, that I ran together with Stephen Downs was based on existing software that he had already created called Grasshopper. More recently, he received quite a substantial grant, I think it was in the 19 million range, uh, to create a uh, LPSS or Learning Performance Support System that he's working on right now. I think they're at the beta stage for beginning to work with the system. But it, uh, it, it's an example of a tool set that moves away from, I, the teacher, determine the content that you will read. I will tell you to read it. I will assess you on it. We will do this in technologies that the institution controls and manages. And that's how we're going to do this learning thing. All the tools up here represent, at least at some level, an approach that may shift that back to the learner in different ways. And so one example, of course, ProSolis, we've talked about uh, a fair bit over the last couple of days. I just want to bring up a quick slide here that sort of looks at what we do or what we try to do with ProSolis as a software system. Uh, basically, it's an opportunity for an individual to plan their learning, take or undertake the learning that they'd like to do, and then to be able to present that or display it to others so others can follow their learning pathways or how they achieved a particular competence. It's heavily social in nature because we believe that the value of learning and knowledge construction requires engagement and dialogue. And so if you want individuals to learn and to learn deeply and to become more comfortable with the complexity of knowledge in the society that we have today where single narratives rarely serve the, the, to address a complex problem, then that's what we try and foster and encourage. And ultimately, there's a credentialing pipeline, we're calling it, where it's a way for you to have uh, authenticated evidence of either prior learning or evidence of learning you can achieve, and then to have that validated by an institution. OK, so now to start wrapping things up a little bit and to start talking about the shift relationally. I just want to return to this idea again. So now that we've sort of addressed what we think are some prominent change trends, we've talked about a range of tools that I think hold some promise that 
will help to challenge the centrality of the LMS or the learning management system in the learning process. It's just to return to this general idea that to understand learning going forward, we have to understand the architecture of knowledge today. And the architecture of knowledge today fits this profile that's open, it's distributed, it's user created, it's generative, it's scalable, and often it's not exclusively, but it can be self-organized. Now we're not saying necessarily this means that this is the entire future of learning. The slide that Dragon uh, talked about where you have the dual layer approach. There are times where structure and sequence and organization are critical. But there are increasing amounts of times where you don't necessarily want that. You want something that has the ability for individuals to move toward a particular idea or concept. Uh, we had lunch today, Kyle made a great point about the need for us to stop thinking about learning as something you complete, especially when you're solving a complex problem, but instead as learning being a way in which you progress toward a certain state. It might not be something that you achieve and tick off the box, but you make progress towards it rather than you completely achieve it. And I think that's an important mindset, especially in these complex knowledge climates that we're in today. All right, so just to hit home a few of these points. So this is something that you're all familiar with, the traditional education model, greatly simplified, but it's a, this idea of faculty, core content, you push it to learner. Uh, the argument that we're trying to articulate is that we need to start seeing this as something that's far more networked, far messier, with a greater number of players and stakeholders and others that are involved. So the faculty doesn't go away. I just want to emphasize that. I'm not, and I certainly hope the university doesn't go away. I have huge affinity for the university and its role in democratic societies and its role in advancing knowledge economy. Uh, I personally hope that the future will hold more, not less universities, more, not less faculty within universities. But we will start to see distributed and more of a multifaceted aspect. Much like we've seen the narrative of the university is complexifying and diversifying, a single narrative doesn't work anymore. Similarly, we're starting to see the narrative of faculty member in the teaching process complexifying. That single narrative of you talk to an expert is going to be enhanced with a range of other dimensions. And that will then require that you have a faculty member who is certainly capable and able to help students navigate personal learning processes, can validate that knowledge that they exhibit, can conduct research, bring students on into authentic learning experience through research activity rather than lecture formats and so on. So that's, I think, an important opportunity. And one of the things I think we most need in this climate is a sense of vision and a sense of goals. Like the best thing to do in a chaotic space where nobody knows what's going on is do something. Create a ripple effect. Interpret the ripples that come back to you. React to those ripples. Do more things. But to sit in a corner and think your way through a problem that you can only behave yourself through is, is you know, a sure way to make your university obsolete. Final three slides. So this is what we've done traditionally within universities. So there's a variety of things that happen. So we've got you know, the content, the curriculum, the teaching practices. We have the assessment process, and we have the learner. Now historically, we've tried to monetize all aspects of this stool or these three pegs, if you will. We've tried to monetize the teaching, the curriculum practices. We've tried to monetize the assessment practices. And unfortunately, in a climate such as we have today, we have a lot of things that can be very easy to duplicate. If you can duplicate something easily with technology, you can't make it an economic value point. One of the best examples of this is, uh, is if you look at uh, early encyclopedias that Microsoft had. And they were first starting to look at how much can we charge for this uh, they, they focus groups at all, $1,500, you know, $2,000. This is incredible. It's like an encyclopedia, but you can click through it, and you've got little videos, and you've got images. It's amazing. They ended up launching it at the, uh, I think it was the 349 value point. And as the, as the internet developed, and as Wikipedia and other tool sets developed, the price dropped and dropped and dropped. When they finally shut it down, it was selling for $19.95. Right? At one point, uh, when we didn't have easy access to information, People in focus groups thought this was worth thousands. And so the same point is here. I think there's faculty members in universities that probably think their content is worth thousands. And yet it's easy to duplicate. So if it can be duplicated, it can't be an economic value point. So our final slide then, or the argument is uh, that we have, is that if you want to look at what, are, what is monetizable in the future, I would argue that while as we used to monetize the teaching practices and the content practice and the, and the assessment practices, that in the future, we're going to have two primary opportunities for monetization. Well, three potentially. One, if we dramatically change our te teaching practices, so it's active learning, uh, enabled in a classroom setting with uh, maker-type focal points, then you can still monetize that. Because for, if you have 20 students, you need a faculty 
If you have 20 more students, you likely need another faculty member. So you can monetize those relationships where you can't duplicate without additional input. So that's one point. A second point is this idea, because we're learning across a, very, a variety of life spaces, that we then, when we go back to university, and all of us will be, instead of having a four-year relationship with Penn State, we're going to have a 40-year relationship with Penn State. Not four years as alumni, 36 years, or four years as a learner, 36 years as alumni, but we're going to have a 40-year learning relationship with institutions, which means that if the institution has our knowledge profile, we can come back, and instead of taking a year-long certificate, if what we know is known to the system, we can get a two-month gap-filling certificate that actually gives us, that validates we have the knowledge for a one-year or two-year certificate, but because we are able to fill knowledge gaps by identifying the learners, that's an opportunity for monetization. That's the second one. And the third one, I'd argue, would sit around the assessment practices. When we learn in a mess of different spaces, it's great on many ways, but unfortunately, Depth of knowledge and learning is a coherence forming, not a fragmentation process. And so that means when we want to know what does George know, or what does Dragon know, or what does Kyle know, or Larry know, we need to then look at a way to pull all of those pieces together so that we can still trust that if I come in and say, you know, I got my certificate from my, my or the George University of Learning thing, then uh, people wouldn't trust that. But if I can say, yeah, you know, I learned in a variety of ways, Penn State doesn't care where I learn, and the employer doesn't really care where I learn. But a Penn State degree and a logo or an emblem on, on my certificate or transcript that says, yeah, George has this qualification, that will work and that will be sufficient. So I think uh, monetizing alternative pedagogical techniques, monetizing gap filling for rapid degree completion and revisiting the university, and monetizing the assessment process is uh, going to be opportunity for the moving forward. So on that note, I think we hit our one hour. We've got a half an hour or so for Q&A. And uh, I just, by the way, this is randomly off topic. I just found out that my flight is delayed, so that's great. So I'm going to probably spend another night in this time. Uh. <laughs> this happened to me last time, so I enjoy visiting. I've just got to start adding an extra day on at the end. Anyway, so we're going to pause for Q&A now. Good. Well, we'll have um, dinner. George and Dragon, thank you both uh, for your uh, really uh, thoughtful and stimulating uh, conversations and ideas. Um, and. Uh, as you know, in the past, if you have a question, uh, please put your hand up and I'll, um, I'll get you the microphone so that we get this recorded. And also, if you're online, uh, Brad will let us know if we have questions there and we'll translate those. Can I start? I, I always think whoever has the microphone gets it. Could you go back to your slide of the uh, interconnected network? About three back. One more. This one or no, no, no. Two more back. Right there. All right. So. You know, the one thing I see in, in this model is that um, the, 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 the connectors between the nodes could represent a path through knowledge. And perhaps what you're suggesting is that, say we took a path through this collection of knowledge and it is now, and we bold that path, perhaps that would be a path that Penn State says, if you have this path. But you're, you're suggesting as well that there may be other, um, either satellites around those nodes, other places I got information, and the university may validate that as well. But th this creates a really rich, diverse series of pathways through my education. I is that a representation? I think so. I mean, it's, so a little bit, I've used the term several times, or the complexification of education. But really the essential view that of this is that, you know, those narratives that we've had, and this is changing in all aspects of, of our lives. It, you know, the world just used to be simpler. You know, we had two genders, right? It was, you know, you got male or female, and now, now you have uh, organizations that are allowing different formats for gender identification than we've had in the past. Uh, we used to be, uh, this Chris Anderson wrote about this in, in uh, The Long Tail, where you'd see uh, I Love Lucy would be watched by 70 plus percent of American households, which meant that if you went to work the next day and you said, uh, yeah, that thing I Love Lucy did, that was funny, wasn't it? And then they would say, yeah, and you had this point of connection. But all of a sudden now, you the most watched show captures maybe 10, 13 percent of the American population because there's so much more out there. And uh, it, it changes, it completely changes the nature of, of how we interact with one another and with information. So that's the idea of complexification, is that a single narrative no longer captures the scope of what's happening. 
It never really did, but we like to think it did because it was easier. Now with universities as well, it may be like, this is a Penn State pathway through. And that'll be, and people who would like that and don't want to you know, walk through more chaotic, uncivilized spaces, uh, they may just prefer, yeah, I'm going to go that pathway through. But they might find as well, and Penn State might find that we, in order to prepare you for the workforce of the industry, we want you to start dealing with ambiguity. We want you to start dealing with uncertainty and self-identifying relevance and a range of other factors. So it, it really does open up a range of exciting possibilities, but we also need to recognize the distress that too many of options place on an individual learner. So there's certainly a range of scaffolding and related support structures that we have to put in to help learners transition. Thanks. We have about as many people outside the room as we do inside the room. And one of them uh, has a question. Alan is asking, I'd love to hear more from George about the Stephen Downs LPSS tool during Q&A. Who's the end user? What's the, what are the purposes? Sure. So uh, probably the best person to address this would be Stephen Downs. Uh, but in his absence, I'll briefly address it. So if you, uh, if you look at the site or if anybody has questions, I can send you an email to it because you can sign up for it now. My email is just gsiemens, G-S-I-E-M-E-N-S at gmail. And uh, I can send you the link directly. But basically, LPSS is a range of different tool sets. It allows for competency and competency identification. It allows for collecting those competencies, almost like you would with a portfolio. The initial intent of it, is, as a large part of the grant, was to make this available to the oil and gas sector, which right now is having some interesting times. So maybe it's going to help them move into new fields as the gas price continues dropping. But uh, that was the initial target audience, but the broad view for LPSS is the future of learning. That's the goal. So it's to say, what kind of an infrastructure do we need? Much like we've been talking about here. Personally owned and controlled, but some central elements that enable it to function well at that level too. But like I said, best place, look for uh, learning and performance support system. Google it. NRC, the National Research uh, Council of Canada, is the, the funder. We'll take one more from outside before going back to the room. Uh, Angela was wondering, she, she wants to know who might be the first to get it and offer a new educational system. Will it be a risk-taking traditional institution or will it be a for-profit or uh, perhaps innovative institutions like SNHU? And then there was some discussion about whether they are risk-taking traditional or not. But the question is, who do you think will be the first to really get it and offer something big and bold and new? Uh, I think in, at any level, it's really something that we need to address, right? And so each of these different levels of institutions that they are mentioned, they are, they are actually catering to different learner populations. And we already can see that there are some of these institutions, such as Southern New Hampshire, they are offering already competency-based degrees. And I think what is Northern um, Arizona uh, State University as well, they are offering another competency-based. So they are large. Uh, you know, Universities, but I'm not sure that they are uh, targeting at the top uh, 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 R1 students that are typically enrolling into the universities such as Penn State. So if you are looking based on that trend, that basic role already gives us uh, an answer. And probably those are some populations which are more underserved and looking for alternative models. But obviously that doesn't exclude opportunities that other institutions should not be engaged in. I, and we are aware of, of many institutions that are one that they are also closely looking into that. I'm not aware, but George might be aware of institutions who are for profit that are looking also for competency-based degrees. And for some reason, uh, at least in the US, the online education was also very often associated with for profit different uh, institutions, while in the rest of the world, even in Canada, uh, online education is typically publicly funded. And it's, the best example is probably the Open University in the UK, which is the largest, at least not the largest, but the best known universities. And there are many other similar public systems in the world, like the University of South Africa or even bigger universities, which are in, uh, in India. So Indira Gandhi, I think, is the largest university in the world. Yeah, and, and I think, so, exactly. So there's a range of publicly funded systems that might be the first. Uh, one opportunity, I, I probably should have included a slide on that, but is how are universities responding to innovation? Like, how are they doing innovation? There's a range of approaches, and this may get at the question that Angelina was asking, but I think on the one hand, there is a possibility that it will come from the for-profit sector because they're, they're able to move quicker, but they have some issues with the accreditation process, which is a bit of a challenge. 
even it was really only until last year where the U.S. Department of Education started recognizing the value of competency-based education, offering experimental sites as an, as an option for that, that we started seeing that. Once dollars flow, then ideas flow in a lot of cases. So, so that's a potential approach. I think probably the most promising one, though, uh, is, is a Skunk Works type project that, where a university says, you know what, we know that we have a big legacy here and we don't want to disrupt that legacy. But why don't we set up this separate thing? And let's just play with this. Let's do things that, that where the existing organization doesn't curtail it. So rather than waiting for someone else to come up with a brilliant idea to kill off the university, we're going to set up this thing, we're going to make it work, and then if it's successful, we'll bring it back into the university and have it continue to influence. This is an example that Deakin University has done quite well with. So I, I'm hoping that the innovation will come from within the university. We have a level of change awareness in higher education now that I've never seen. Mm -hmm. um, just like you said, the uh, university would have to, to wait between the legacy part of this and all this innovation. And yesterday, Dragon talked about there being a totally different discussion what universities are for. Is it for workforce preparation? And are, are all these, are we speeding up the process of um, the education, higher ed, higher ed being part of, you can pick and choose something that's useful for you for the workplace rather than being a better human being in the history of humankind, you know what I mean, being a better citizen. So what's your take on all this? What about the, the original functional idealism of university? You know, I, first I'll just respond briefly. I, I think it's both. Uh, I think this idea of diversifying narratives means that we don't have to choose one. That the university isn't only about making a better human being, it's also about employment. And so my vision, as I mentioned, is that the universities today become better integrated to the societies in which they serve. So that the university isn't a space where we go for four years, but instead it's a part of a community that's outreach initiatives that influence students in, you know, in the school system. It has opportunities for individuals on the weekend to, to hang out on campuses that, that universities become public social spaces for people to learn, which is what you would expect in a learning environment. And, and that'll be a lot of everything from arts to culture to related events. But by the same account, a good majority of students in higher education are there because they're looking for work. Now, they might not be looking for a specific type of vocational work, which is you know, terrific opportunities in that regard certainly in apprentice fields right now, they might be looking for research work or business or whatever else. But I think it's a bit of a false dichotomy to, to say, are we about work or are we about making a better human being? I think having people employed makes better human beings. And by the same account, having employed people being aware of culture, arts, and history of ideas and factors within society makes them a better employee as well. So we really need to start seeing that as an integrative thing, not as two separate things that are uh, there, there's also something, uh, having spent much time the last couple of years in Australia as well, something which is so very, very well articulated into institutional policies is basically the so-called graduate attributes that each graduate of any Australian university needs to have. And those basically span across these uh, subject domain competencies. Those are basically being responsible citizen, being ethical professional, being uh, uh, having communication skills, having information types of skills. And then every single Australian university needs to have their quality assurance information systems as well, where each course individual is also tracked across these graduate quality dimensions. So for each university, they basically always say we have these five or six uh, elements. And I quite like the policy which was published by the University of Sydney, which is really based on a very careful and thorough research what these types of policies should be. Especially if you are moving into these even competency-based models. I'm thinking that basically it would be even much easier to track down which of these types of skills learners are having and to what extent they gain them. Presently, even though Australian universities are trying to do that and they are very carefully designing technologies which help them to assure that some of these are acquired by learners, it is still not really that uh, easy, simply because these types of assessment, assessments are not necessarily always well aligned with the types of learning outcomes that are out there claimed that learners have inside of those courses. Therefore, with the opportunities that are emerging through some of these technologies, it will be much easier to have better quality assurance where we can serve both of these elements, as George pointed out. 
Um, so you had a slide um, that acknowledged the um, influx of venture capital and startups in the ed tech space. And um, so I have some uh, concerns or reservations about um, those, that, that kind of the gold rush idea, I guess. So I was curious if there were um, models or companies that you would point to that you think partner really effectively and borrow from the expertise from teachers and faculty, instructional designers and others within the institution rather than kind of trying to compete and working on their technology expertise and not really concerned as much with learning outcomes? It's an excellent question. Thank you for raising that. So first of all, uh, it seems like in the last several quarters at least, or the last several years, the amount of venture capital dollars flowing into education it, it hits new high water marks every cycle, which means there's more momentum and more activity. One of the things that I think we need to reflect on is uh, the, the individuals that are involved in that activity, while it's certainly important for innovation and there's been some great tool sets that are starting to be produced, I mean, if you look at K-12 tools like Clever and others that are starting to have a fairly strong impact serving a single functionality or need, but I think that innovation, that's an important part of the ecosystem of higher education. The difficulty or where I start to get a little bit agitated or whatever is when those conversations start to drive universities rather than universities driving those conversations. So what I mean with that is, uh, as universities, we have a unique role in society. And we have that role plays, it's broad, but I think it will become more and more critical. We serve the local economy. We serve the state or national economy. Uh, we also serve as, for preserving the legacy of ideas so that, as, and people can start to see themselves within the history of ideas and they can start to see the context that they're in. Those are bottom lines, if you will, that are relevant to a university, advancing science, advancing knowledge. For a lot of startups, the bottom line is quite simple, and that's money. So I'll give you one example. So Udacity came out as a MOOC provider, and there, there was, I mean, the hype was off the chart. So at one point, there was a quote made uh, by the CEO that in the future, there would be 10 universities, and Udacity would be one of them. They were revolutionizing higher education. They had found the magic bullet for learning, and the list goes on. These were the kind of hype that we were subjected to. But what happened was they weren't making money being that kind of a system. So now they're basically a corporate training company, right? They're just providing training for programming, Python, and so on. To, to, so that's what happens. You went from this lofty perch of we're going to change universities to now we're doing what Knowledge Planet did in the late 90s. And that was simply because as a, as a firm that's funded by venture capital, you have to chase the dollar. And so I don't see any yet that I would say is, is a perfect model for that. I think the venture capital space or even the startup are a part of the ecosystem of higher education going forward. Universities should, we've talked about learners owning their own learning, universities should own their own faith. And so what I mean by that is that they need to set up, whether it's incubator spaces or whether it's startup hubs, a few systems have already started with this where they're working closely with entrepreneurial communities. That way at least the ideals and the values of a university get presented. And, but keep in mind, Google, as an example, came out of Stanford. So we need our systems that had huge value and many of their initial ideas emulated the structure of the university, the research time, the, the focus, the, the collegiality the discourse, and the list goes on. So I'm hoping if universities take seriously the nature of these changes and the growing presence of entrepreneurial activity, that'll give them an opportunity to create systems that allow them to shape the kinds of tools that are being developed, or at least fund opportunities that exist today. Can I also add there, and, and this is a great point, really. Uh, in, in many cases, it's also decision-making process inside of institutions and how many, uh, how some institutions are making decisions which technologies will be acquired and how they are dealing with these different types of vendors. Whichever area we pick, whether it's analytics, whether it's adaptive learning and so on, in many cases uh, we have different types of solutions which really don't deliver so much as they claim that they are delivering and they are also not based on so, so robust evidence that we know that it should be. And we also are using so heavily inside of institutions. Every academic is so pretty much prone to use of that strong evidence. However, there are certain types of things that we really need to change in the cultures of in the institutions. Also, probably part of our governance and policies needs to be affected there as well. Uh, there are various reasons that we typically don't get to appreciate so much evidence which is coming from different areas that we are not so familiar with. And therefore, decision, maker, decision makers are also not familiar with these types of elements. Even when I'm talking to certain companies, obviously they are driven by their own goals and missions. 
some of those original missions of these years, so, or those even uh, for-profit commercial companies were great to change education like desire to learn had uh, in the past. However, the question becomes, uh, as the company is evolving, the company, what was once a small startup, becomes completely something different. And therefore, basically, the universities need to, in that process, be uh, agile and clever enough to look what are their needs and engage into partnerships so that partnerships generate better opportunities for them. Uh, so I have a, a question a little bit that revolves around scale. So MOOCs uh, have really forced us to think about scale in new ways, and it might be kind of too much too fast for a lot of people because we spend a lot of time talking about what do we lose when we go to these big scales, but we like to think about also what are the affordances that we get when you get to the, these kind of new scales that we haven't thought of before. And a lot of the things that we've talked about the last couple of days feel like they do better at larger scales, right? The more learners, the more people you have and engage in these spaces, the more opportunities you have for rich learning and things like that. So I was just curious if, if, if you kind of agree with that, and at what point do these environments kind of take off? At what point do they shine uh, in terms of scale? And how do we start to socialize this idea? Because on a lot of college campuses, the 700-person lecture hall right, that we have here is kind of frowned upon, and we talk about how do we shrink down these experiences. And I think with a lot of what we're talking about now is how do we go the other way? How do we shoot this up to a, a scale that these new models become possible, and we can kind of play with these new pedagogies? So, yeah, you know, one of the things there to look at is this idea that Anderson wrote about, uh, you know, more is different, that if you have a larger group of individuals, it changes things, it from qualitatively changes things. When we look at the learning process, though, learning with seven, eight hundred students doesn't happen, actually. We almost always learn with smaller clusters, and you'll find this even with large MOOCs. Unfortunately, MOOCs to date haven't done a good job of providing profile development, where you get to know uh, different students, and you can click and see the background. I mean, Novoed's done a little bit with it. But other than that, the other vendors, they, they haven't really gotten into it. So at the end of the process, though, if you want effective learning, it's going to be small group, small, reasonably small social circles of learning. And this is the idea that comes from network theory. So there's three essential types of ties in network theory, and each one of them provides a different type of information. So one type of a network is this idea of strong ties, and that's family network. These are people that you're, you interact with regularly, and you know what they know. You harmonize knowledge with one another on a regular basis. A second type of a connection is uh, this idea of weak ties. This could be uh, somebody that you went to college with and you haven't talked to in 20 years, or it could be you worked at a company years ago and you knew somebody who knew somebody. That's novel information. There's a high level of novel information. So strong ties generate high levels of trust. Weak ties can generate high levels of novel information. But there's a third type of ties that received a little bit more attention in the literature recently, which is the idea of dormant ties. Now, a dormant tie is a strong tie that used to exist. Let's say a close coworker at a company that you worked at six, seven years ago, but then life happened, married, have kids, both of you, whatever, and all of a sudden you look back and you're, and you're uh, you remember, hey, yeah, we, we worked together for like a decade. The value of a dormant tie is that it has two things. One, it has the trust that exists with a, uh, with a strong network. And two, it has the novel information because you haven't harmonized your knowledge through dialogue lately. So I think the same holds true when we're involved in these MOOC forums, in these big spaces. And you'll, that's why you'll see tools like Twitter. You'll see folks that are following a hashtag, which is a relationship to an idea rather than a person. And eventually, we saw this with the first MOOC that we ran. There's a cluster of individuals that took that MOOC that still interact with one another. So when we're starting to design learning experience, if you're going to do learning at scale, you have to account for those multiple types of ties. You do want novel information, but if you want depth of learning, learners are going to have to function in closed spaces with high levels of trust. Uh, if I can add here uh, additional few more information there. Uh, some of these things that are happening is basically they are consequential. They are happening in there because you provided that context for learners to establish any of these kinds of ties, as George was uh, talking about. However, what happens in most of the MOOCs is, and I think George already pointed out very clearly, like last year when we were at the University of Australia conference in Melbourne, was it Melbourne? Uh, there was a discussion about MOOCs and uh, basically we don't really innovate much. Uh, we only know, in the only innovation we, with MOOCs was scale, not so much pedagogical innovation and so on. We are still, and many are still using the old same measures for uh, assessing MOOCs as we are using for assessing classrooms and conventional uh, universities 
So, for example, one of the most obsolete measures for MOOCs is the completion rate, which is pretty much like irrelevant measure. So what we basically need to do is, first of all, we need to think how learning happens and how we can design learning at the scale. And we know also from the existing research as well that the design-based learning and interaction between learners is much more effective than just contextual learning interaction. Because we need to scaffold that interaction. That scaffolding of interaction should not be just even inside of these courses, but also even through different types of informal spaces where learners need to provide uh, additional opportunities. In that sense, we need to think about additional types of affordances that should become available to facilitate smoother types of interaction and also more intentional in that basically process through design. Thank you. Um, I, I think Kyle is working on a question with a guest online, so we'll wait until that formulates a little bit. I wanted to go back to um, a, a conversation because a lot of this conversation has been around the uh, the opportunity that's ahead of us, right? That is actually present. Uh, so much of this churn is in the system, and, and who's going to be first to the marketplace? I'm wondering if you could speak to what our leaders should be thinking about and how they might be positioning themselves for their institutions, wherever they are, to you know, engage in some new thinking about the institution. Well, from, a, from a leadership end, I mean, that's, it's always difficult to give advice to people who suffer the consequences of their decisions. Uh, but uh, I think from a leadership end, the first thing I think you need to recognize is just that we're in a different landscape. It's, a diff it's, it's not business as usual. This isn't like the period where we had the hype of, you know, maybe we can do VCR teaching. I remember the University of Manitoba biology teacher running in, in a video of a now dead professor and putting in the VCR and hitting play, and that was the lecture. I mean, that was going to revolutionize education. But again, it's, it's this idea of Carlotta Perez's work of socio-technical economic structures. Those are, the, those are the changes that change big institutions. A single variable or a single factor doesn't change it. So I think for, for uh, leaders to, uh, to, to particularly be aware of what is the, the, the core change? You know, what is the ground zero of change? What are the elements that we're looking at? And then use that as sort of a template. I've tried to argue that information, the architecture of information, the architecture of knowledge, is that base change element that we need to pay attention to. And as goes knowledge, so goes the university. Uh, but so I think we need to get down to what are those base elements. Uh, from there, it's important to start thinking about how do you get together a divergent set of ideas. So there's interesting work in fields of sense making that looks at uh, this idea of strong beliefs weakly held. So as a leader, you obviously are making decisions constantly. But to start to recognize that maybe some of the core assumptions that I'm making aren't as valid as they were five years ago or even you know, 10 years ago. And so then the opportunity there, which is interesting work to look at medical researchers, the doctors that were most effective from the diagnostic end, weren't the ones that read and read and read and read until or figured out and you know, thought and thought until they knew what it might be. But they're the ones that were able to make a quick decision, but then when new information entered, they were quickly able to alter their decision. Those are the doctors that were most effective. And I think the same holds true from university. And it's a point I made earlier, is do something. Create ripples. See the feedback you get from the ripples. Do more things based upon that feedback. So I think that those are some you know, mindsets or attributes that I think are critical from a leadership end. But I really do think you have to start recognizing the, the need for seeing the university. Like when a, when a researcher and academic encounters a phenomenon with which she's not familiar, you enter a stage or she'll enter the stage of being a researcher, whether it's that whole process of hypothesis formation and testing and so on. Today, I think the university is that phenomenon that we don't quite understand. And to take a research-oriented mindset that says we have to begin doing things and experimenting and seeing different things, that we can better understand what role does this play in society. In one way, it really brings the whole idea of information on itself. We're often looking at this thing. Now we're looking at ourselves and saying, how do we play this? Exactly. And there's another lesson that we need to learn from open universities as well. And one of the former presidents of Athabasca University also when he was talking about the leadership inside of open universities. I think this kind of mission is and the message which was learned by open universities is now actually being reflected in many other institutions as we are seeing the technology increase and the basically changing landscape. And that is basically that there is never be any more business as usual. And that's basically the norm that most of uh, open universities at least 
those skilled and successful leaders always had. They basically always recognized that there would be always uh, for them question of the existence, whether they should be existing or not. And secondly, what will be the source of their revenue. So they always were forced in that process to reconsider themselves and to rediscover themselves as well in the new marketplace. And then basically, I think that pretty much goes well with the, what George indicated, basically, that universities and the leadership in universities adopt some of those more entrepreneurial ideas and approaches to running, basically being able to accept failure. Don't have the entire system bet on a single idea, but rather have small and diverse portfolio and basically be ready to learn from a failure. I think we have time for one more question from outside. This is from Alan who asks, for Dragon, is there is decision making about technology technology acquisition handled differently by higher ed in other parts of the world? And he's thinking of the open source bias in Europe and Australia. So it's technology acquisition decision making. Is it different in other parts of the world? Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's a that, that's a really great question. Uh, I haven't really studied that in detail in that sense, but. I would say it is very much, and but I think it also has to do with different types of priorities that are existing in different types of organizations. Uh, I, I would find, first of all, that the US, uh, US uh, educational overall landscape is much more diverse. It has so much diversity in terms of the level of funding, in terms of types of funding, and in terms of the priorities and the populations universities are serving. When we go back to Europe, the type of funding is typically coming from public institutions. Uh, private institutions are typically uh, considered second or third uh, higher quality institutions. They are not really having that much of strong reputation. Secondly, in terms of the numbers and how funding of universities operates, even if it's, they are public, universities typically don't pay tuition. We can see only recently pushback in Germany that although they ex accepted a modest uh, tuition fee tuition fees like two years ago, they now completely canceled, and those tuition fees are still under 500 euros, I think, annually, which is something which is hardly imaginable in, in, in the US. So that, that's another important priority. Therefore, in that sense, when you are dealing and operating these types of uh, environments, uh, you, you need to also think that basically universities probably have much more freedom to uh, relate to certain ideals and to certain ideals of openness in education and promote some of those. They have much more freedom. Uh, at, at the same time, uh, of course, some of those ideals are not necessarily always the drivers, but they are also additional things that are driving additional parts of the world. For example, in Europe, there is a completely different notion of privacy. And Europeans are, in that sense, much more careful in terms of who they are sharing their data with. And they are really considering the, the word big data as a really serious bad word. And they are not really having that big bind. Therefore, there is another cultural uh, element that is driving the economy over there. In Australia, it is uh, slightly different. They are always considered, they always considered their uh, universities and higher education as another industry sector. And in that sense, they always have clear measures of efficiencies and uh, ways how that sector should be measured and worked on, uh, around. And in many cases, these institutions recognize that the open source is not necessarily just accepted because uh, it was clear bottom line, but because also institutions were much more efficient and much more responsive to the needs of their learners. So that, that's why they were not necessarily always buying just out that outside solution. And I'm thinking perhaps some institutions, at least in the US, they think if they buy a new solution, they think they solve the problem. That's right. And this is also coming uh, from a general enterprise commute, computing culture. While it might be quite effective to do that, for example, in accounting, because you are not buying SAP as a, just an information system. You are buying the whole business process with it. The question becomes, to what extent you really want to align your organizational and institutional processes, especially in Europe, which is so diverse. Or you need solutions which can be adjusted much better to your own needs. Anyways, hope this addresses some of these points. Wonderful. Well, I see that we're, uh, we're at our time limit. And um, please join me in thanking George and Dragon for being with us today and stimulating our thinking. Thank you.